You've gone. Oh. Have I clicked the wrong thing or? Uh, no, there, just, there you are. It's okay. I've got you. Um, got you. So I know you were saying on, on Facebook that the acting world's kind of still closed down the the film business, all that sort of thing. So. Yes, quite honestly, um, for the most part, the industry is closed. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's no work really a uh, little bit, but, and you know, hopefully it's starting up again. But then, with with this Indian variant, who knows? It may all stop again. Yeah, yeah. So it's very um, up in the air, isn't it? And, and it is. It is. Um, do you do much theatre at all? Is it mostly sort of TV and films these days? Not any. Not not anymore. Not if I can help it. Um, <laughs> it's too much like hard work in the, you know these days. Uh, the, the idea of you know get, getting on a tube train every every afternoon and sweating up to town to, to do a show and then coming home late at night, it's not for me anymore. I'm too old. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of actors sort of get the same point. They feel probably feel the, uh, the, the same way, really. Um, yes. Well, you know, it, it, it entirely depends, of course, if somebody came up with the right with the right job and the right money. Yes. Um, you know, I, I might make the effort. I'd stay at my club and, you know, but um, for the most part, no. I'd much prefer to do film and television. Oh yeah, it sounds a lot, a lot nicer. I, I remember Patrick Troughton used to describe theatre as uh, all that shouting in the evening, and he didn't like, he didn't like. <laughs> that's 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 one way of describing it. Yes. Hmm. Well, I am a, I am a big theatre fan, so I do in, I do enjoy the medium, but I can I can understand doing eight shows a week is um, yes. you know, how you do it really. Yeah, it's it's very hard work, and I've just you know just re re really in the last couple of years, I've I've health wise, I've slowed down a lot, and um, and I don't think it's for me anymore. Really, as I say, it, it, if somebody came up with the right offer, who knows? But for the most part, I'd, I'd rather stick to TV and movies. Is there anything you 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 miss from from theatre, or, or do you get? Oh, I oh I miss everything. I mean, I miss the audiences, and I miss the the um, you know the personal touch of it. The mm. the fact that it's live, uh, yes. it's wonderful. You know, we have a little uh, tiny theatre here called the Little Theatre on the Park here in Chesham, which where I did two shows. Um, sort of three or four years ago, two Christmases. I did Christmas Carol one year, and then the next year I did a, a, a production of Pinocchio. Oh, um, and, and it was wonderful, that, you know, studio theatre, where the audience were no more than three or four feet from me, you know, the front row. Yeah. Um, I could easily touch them. Um, and that, it's, a, it's a wonderful experience. And it is for the audience, too, because it's so close and truthful. And we're not used to that anymore. You know, even in the theatre, there's a, you know, you're 20 feet back from the cross arch. And it, there is sort of a, a demarcation between the audience and the actors. Yeah. Um, but in studio theatre, that, that demarcation disappears altogether. And you're just another person in the room. Mm. And that can be very exciting. Because I've seen some production at the Old Vic where they put you in the round and your yes things and things like that are, 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 are quite nice. Um, yes, good fun. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you very much for for joining me tonight. That's very very kind of you. Not at all. I'm happy to be here. So, because um, obviously, I'd, originally, obviously, I was doing in person events, and obviously, with with COVID, I put all those on the uh, the back seat thing. Here, it's just going to be a month, two months, and then of course, yes, it's yes. Um, it's it's the same with conventions, you know. I miss it a lot. It, it's uh, it's such fun, not only being with my friends, but 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 you know, meeting the public, hmm. and all that's yeah. You know, it stopped whatever two years ago, and we haven't done any. Um, it's it's such a shame. Oh, it, it is, isn't it? I, I I like to go to conventions whenever I, I can, and I know that there's some conventions taking bookings at the moment, but I'm. I live in, in Devon, so I'm not sure I want to commit to, to go to London. And all that. Exactly, I'm very hesitant too. You know, I'm. I, my girlfriend lives in Portugal, and I, I, sort of made up my mind. I want, you know, I, 
I was going to be able to go because it was on the green list and all that. And then I thought, well, you know, Indian variant, maybe I'll just wait and see and let the rush, you know, subside a bit before I actually book a ticket. And now, lo and behold, as of today, it's off the green list. Well, my, my, my boss was going to go to Portugal. She was just saying about it today. She's going to go on Tuesday. Right. And it's changing. So, um, so she's probably not going to be going, um, and, uh, unfortunately, for, for her. So, um, yeah. But there we go. There we go. Hmm. Um, so shall I just start the questions and we sort of go? go yes, do, do. I'm, I'm, I, I warn you in advance that um, I, I'm probably going to disappoint you and your your uh, listeners, watchers, whatever they are, um, because it was a very long time ago and, you know, your questions are bound to be very detailed and <laughs> for the most part I'll probably say I can't remember. And well, you'll think, oh, oh God, he's senile, you know, <laughs> but... I'm sure it'd be my, the fault of my questions rather than, than, than your answers. No, no, it, it, it's, it's, it's me. Um, I don't know if you know, but the, uh, um, on Monday, I think, a new sort of definitive Blu-ray edition of the, of the Tom Baker Doctor Who stories came out. Um, yeah. And a, a friend of mine just gave it to me, and I watched a little bit of it last night. Mm. Um, I watched one of the behind the sofa things, you oh, know, yeah. where you get people talking about it as they watch it. Mm. And uh, of course, there were clips of, of, of uh, us doing it. And um, it, it was lovely to be reminded of it. But my goodness, it was a long time ago and, and in another world, it seems almost. Yeah, I must admit, as, as fans, we tend to forget just how, you know, how, how long it's been, you know, almost 50 years, isn't it? Yes, that? yes. Well, you only, you only have to look at me. <laughs> but I, I, well, I must admit, some people change a lot, don't they, in, in, in that time. Some, and, you know, That's true. And, and I, um, I wouldn't say that you've changed that, that dramatically. So. Well, in, in 50 um, years, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a long time. <laughs> um, I mean, did you ever think that people would still be you know, uh, bothering you about, about Dr. Hill all these years later? Abs abs well, absolutely not. Well, at the time, you mean? Uh, yeah, at the time, yeah. yeah. Abs absolutely not. I mean, I was, I was you know, thrilled to, to be asked to do it, but um, I, it wasn't then uh, quite as iconic as it later became, you know? Mm. Yeah. It was, and for me as a as a young actor, it was just the next job. Hmm. Um, it was, it was, you know, I, I, there was no, there was no question of thinking, you know, oh my God, I'm, I'm, I've, I've landed a part in an iconic show, and people are going to, you know, be watching this for years to come. Hmm. Uh, you know, you just thought, well, you know, I'll shoot this episode or these few episodes, and. Uh, Somebody will watch them next week or whenever it is, you know, when it goes out, the, whatever the TX date is, it'll, the, the public will see it and that will be the end. Hmm. Um, but <laughs> no such thing. Um, no. It's no. extraordinary, really. Because it, It's always voted the, uh, the best of the classic. Yes, it is. And, and uh, of course, much of that is to do with Tom. Hmm. Um, uh, and and also um, much of it was to do with Terry Nation, um, you know, who was brought back to write, um, you know, the genesis of the Daleks, the how it all how the thing all began, and he he of course invented them, and you know it, it all came out of his crazy brain, and he was a wonderful writer. So the writing shows it, it, it it's it's wonderful writing. Oh yeah, it is indeed. Yeah. Um... I mean, obviously, in in seventy five when it was was made, obviously, it's World War Two is obviously becoming a distant memory, but of course, it's still very much living memory. It, yes, uh, indeed. The theme, obviously, the, the themes are quite, um, you know, they're not particularly subtle. The the <laughs> the, the allusion to, to references, yes, it's it's yeah. true, and the, you know, even the costuming, for goodness sake, hmm. um, and the and the, the you know the mode of speech. I mean, you know, I remember I was sort of directed to 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 speak almost like a Dalek, you know, um, with that kind of um, passionate intensity and unthinking, you know, ex expecting unthinking obedience and all that. Yeah. Um, 
you know, to, to, to say nothing of the fact that, you know, he was a jumped up boy general, you know, and who had been promoted way beyond his abilities simply because there wasn't anybody else. You know? Everybody else had been killed because the war had been going on for so long. Mm. Um, but yes, and, and, and you look at it now and it's all very stark and, and yes, the references to Nazism are very strong. Mm. Oh yeah, they are, they are indeed. Um, uh, what do you remember from, from actually make, making the, the episode? Is it a bit of a blur or do you have any specific memories from...? Um, it, not, not really, you know, I, I remember the doing of it. I remember that table with the sand and the little models and... Um, and I remember those corridors that were, you know, we were forever running up and down. You know, we had two corridors that were about 20 feet long each. Yeah. And, and we kept running up and down them in different directions, pretending that there were, you know, hundreds and hundreds of feet of different corridors all over the, all over the um, building, you know. Um, <laughs> I remember that. And I remember the adrenaline of of because it was shot as live in those days it wasn't still live television i just missed live television with my first television job which was zed cars which was a few years before this yeah um and it was one of the first series uh that was shot uh that was not live it didn't go out live it was shot as live but it wasn't broadcast at the same moment it was shot yeah. Um, which was the definition of live, but it was shot as live. And so you would literally run from one set to another because when the camera cut, it, you know, if you were supposed to be walking in the door, you had to be walking in the door, regardless of what you were doing in the previous scene. Mm. So, you know, you would run around the studio trying to keep up with the story. Mm. Uh, it, was, it was very exciting. Mm. Uh, um... Uh, so um, yes, yeah, they could obviously do a second take. It went disastrously wrong, but otherwise they would they would obviously do it as uh, as uh, it, exactly as live. Yes, exactly. And I don't recall whether we ever did any any second takes. I don't think we did. Hmm. Do you remember much about that? The the, the, the main cast obviously you've got uh, Michael Wisher as as Davos, for example. Yes. Um, I, it's awful to say, but I really don't remember him at all. Mm. Um, I, I, I remember him more by the stories about him than, than, yeah. than he himself. You know, the, the thing about him insisting on rehearsing with a paper bag over his head and all that, I'm sure it's not true, mm. but um, it, 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 frightfully apocryphal, but Tom swears it, it, he saw him with a bag over his head. I don't remember that. Yeah. Uh, if he rehearsed with a bag over his head, it wasn't when I was watching. Um, you know, that kind of thing, his commitment, his, his, you know, his passion for, for, for the part and um, sort of living the part, you know, which supposedly he did. Um, and the same thing applied to Peter Miles, who sort of traded on it for the rest of his life, really, bless him. Mm. Um, because he didn't, re he didn't really do much else. I don't know what I don't know about Michael Wisher. I don't know what other work he did. But um, as I say, I don't remember. I, I don't even remember what he looks like. You know, under that mask. I, I, if I wanted to know what he looked like, I'd have to Google him. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, it, I think possibly the reason for for me not having uh, noticed any of these people too much. Uh, Peter Miles became a friend much later mm. um, because he was a passionate fan of Alo Alo. And uh, so he kind of befriended me in later years. Mm. But um, I think at the time I was in awe of and rather frightened of Tom. Yeah. Um, because, you know, he was the star of the show and he was, he's a very powerful character. I mean, the, the person, not, not the character of Doctor Who, yeah. but Tom himself, he's a very strong presence. Um, and, and so, of course, I, I remember him very well. Um, uh, and I remember the girls because I'm a straight man and I like those things. Yeah. Um, and... Um, and, and of course, David, um, David Maloney. Yeah. Um, 
who again was a very strong presence, um, very funny, very, you know, great, great fun to be with. And I'd worked with him before. Oh, right. So, um, yes, on Softly, Softly. So um, he, you know, I knew him. Hmm. Um, and so those were the people who really influenced me at the time. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, really Tom and David for the most part. Uh, would it been um, was David the reason why you got got the job? Was it sort of higher? Yeah. Yes, he asked he asked me to do it um, I, because I I yeah I I played a part for him in in softly softly and it was a nice nice little part and I guess he liked my work and you know wanted to work with me again, um, which was lovely. Uh, uh, repeat business is always a nice pat on the back. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. When a director wants to hire you again. Did you um, find that, because obviously it was Tom Baker's first first season, did you find that he was already very much in the role? He wasn't nervous, he was quite commanding, from what you say? Yeah, yes, I, the, the latter. He, 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 he didn't seem nervous to me. He seemed, you know, very sure of what he was doing. Hmm. Um, I heard him once say recently um, that he was rather sort of disappointing when when... The, the recording ended you know at the end of the evening when we'd recorded an episode mm. he was rather disappointed that it was all over and he had to go home oh, you know right. he had he he loved it and he just enjoyed himself so much doing it mm. um so yeah and and that kind of passion was was very much very evident to the other actors and so he was wonderful to play opposite you know I mean, it's see, because obviously Tom Baker did seven seven years of Doctor Who, and obviously he, nobody's ever got close to that since. No. You, you have very passionate people who are in lifelong fans, like David Tennant and Peter Capaldi, and they come in and they, for some reason, they could do a few years, and then that that's it. Is there something about television that has got harder that you have noticed in your career that may mean why people just want to do something, and oh, I've got to do something else, or? Um, I don't know. Um, I think possibly it's, it's sort of, a, a, I don't want to put this the wrong way, but I think it's, it's, it's a less attractive job than it was somehow working for the BBC. Um, for me, uh, you know, in the very early days was a real joy. Mm. Um, and it was it was very much to, sort of being part of a family, to use a horrible modern expression. Um, but it really was. It was it was quite small and and select, and everybody knew everybody, and people had tremendous respect for each other. You know, for the people doing the work, mm. um, and that's all long gone. Right. Um, yeah. You know, it's very impersonal now, and um, you know, in, in in the old days, it was oh, lovely to see you. How are you? And all that. And now it's who are you? Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. who? What? What program? Oh, show me your identification. You know, all that. It's it's very impersonal, and um, we we noticed it particularly on a lower low when we you know because that went on for ten years. And and in the pilot, I don't know if you know the BBC Television Centre well, but in front of it there was a, a what we called the D, which was a D-shaped parking area. Oh, oh yes, and I, yeah. And I suppose there was parking for you know twenty or thirty cars. And um, when we shot the pilot, I parked in the D. And when we shot the first series, we were shunted to a car park slightly to the side. And by the second series, we were shunted to the new multi-story car park. And by about the fourth series, we were, we were only allowed into the multi-story car park if there was still room after the more important people had parked there. And, and by the later series, it was, oh no, the actors can't park on the, on the lot. You have to go and park in aerial way. And it was sort of, you know, you had to walk a mile, literally a mile. Wow. 
And that was the kind of attitude, how the attitude changed. You know, it, 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 it just, it had become so large and impersonal. Yeah. And so, yeah, sorry, to answer your question, I think probably now um, it, it's, it, it's, not, it's not what it was. And so I'm not surprised that people don't last as long. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that way. Um, you know, the idea of being in a series at the BBC for, for 10 years now would fill me with horror. Yeah. Um, okay. You know, it would be because it would be, as I say, a very impersonal experience. Mm. And, you know, the work, the work would sort of loom for years ahead. And one would think, oh, do I have to, you know, <laughs> which is quite a different feeling than I had in the in the old days. I sound very old, don't I? I'm sorry. No, 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 not at all. I, mean, I, I, I spoke to different people and they've kind of said how the industry's changed as well. So they're very much echoing what, what you just told me. So. Yes, and, and it is. It's it, it's the whole industry and it's it's um it's it's not just attitudes, it's it's also logistics, you know. Um we used to rehearse in the Acton Hilton, you know, the, the, the BBC rehearsal rooms in Acton. Yeah. And um, they were sold some years ago. And so now, you you know, you're in some, I don't know, some professional rehearsal room that they've hired that has nothing to do with the BBC. Um, and you're probably shooting in a studio that has nothing, you know, it's just a, a studio for hire. So again, it's not nobody knows anybody. It's nothing to do with the BBC. It's just a sort of a studio, mm. um, it, rather than going into the BBC itself and walking into the one of those wonderful iconic studios and shooting. You know, which was which was such a privilege and a pleasure. It was interesting what you're saying about as a lower low went on. It's like we treated worse and and worse and worse because obviously yeah. the, the series was getting you know, very good ratings. It was becoming very popular in America. Oh, yeah. We were doing, was it 26 episodes a year to put to... At one point, yeah. Because they obviously wanted those high episode counts. Yes, at one point. And, and, and it, it seemed that the more, we, the, the more popular we were worldwide, the worse we were treated. But I think that, as I say, again, that's just to do with logistics, probably. I think I've heard some of the stories about Only Fools and Horses in that respect. The more popular it got, the more the BBC resented it. So it seems like a nod sort of... Is that so? I hadn't heard yeah. that about Only Fools. Yeah. It's certainly that it's it's strongly the feeling I have that we were sort of... Our popularity was sort of resented. Hmm. I mean, what was it like trying to knock out 26 in, in, in a year? Was that, I imagine, quite exhausting? It was exhausting. It, it nearly killed the writers because um, mm. there were only two of them. Yeah. And, um, it, it, you know, in America, when, when they do 26 a year, they have, you know, a team of 20 writers mm. um, and they all have assistants and their assistants all have assistants. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I remember being shocked when I made a, a comedy series in, in Los Angeles. Um, at the difference between you know, between that and what I was used to, yeah, um, extraordinary. Um, you know, room absolutely crammed with people, and one had no idea what they all did, but they were all hired to be a part of it. Whereas we were just, you know, we would turn up on a Monday morning for a read through, and there would be whatever you know, a dozen actors, and there would be David Croft and Jeremy Lloyd, the two writers. David also director and also producer and David's assistant and that was it. Right. Um, it was all we needed, you know. Um, David's PA, who organised everything and brought us the scripts and blah blah blah. David, who directed it, and who had written it, and his partner Jeremy, who'd written it with him, and they, you know, watch rehearsals and make any adjustments that were necessary, or then none ever were really. Hmm. And the actors who were actually doing the work. You know, and that was it. There wasn't any need for anybody else. But um, oh, it's not like that in Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> um, what did you feel uh, when you first read the Hello Hello pilot? Did you think this was all? Oh, this is going to be very good. Um, I, I I thought. Um, I think what everybody else thought, which was really, 
funny Gestapo, are you sure? <laughs> and I thought, okay, it's David Croft. It has, you know, uh, and it's Jeremy Lloyd, two of the greatest living comedy writers. And David knows what he's doing when he decides to make a series and, you know, or a pilot. Hmm. Um, and of course I had been in Secret Army, so which of which Alo Alo was a send up. Yes. So, um, so I, I sort of got the joke immediately. Hmm. Um, and I, I just thought, yeah, well, this is dangerous waters um let's see how it goes and it you know it was i don't know halfway through the second series or something we suddenly realized what we had mm. um you know yeah after we'd made uh, i don't know maybe eight or ten episodes mm. and we suddenly thought god this is good you know yeah. <laughs> this is this is really getting popular and mm. um and 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 it works it just works and curiously, still does uh, to this day. I, I I can't believe it. I I occasionally I catch an, an episode, you know, uh, uh, and and I I think my God, it's it's it is good. It's good. It's still funny. Um, I mean, I love Dad's Army. I love Dad's Army, but it's getting very creaky. I think. Yes, it should be. Yes. Uh, uh, in comparison, I think, but I think Alolo still really holds up. I mean, that's my, just my opinion. Other, others will disagree, I'm sure. No, no, I, I agree, agree completely. It's, it's got this sort of, um, you know, a, a classic that, that doesn't date it. So, it, you know, yes, it, there's a sort of freshness to it still, and I don't know why. I don't know what what we did right. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, um, uh, I just don't think on a lower load. Um, what was it like working with your fellow cast members? Because obviously you've got such talented people like um, uh, Jack Haig and um, Hilary uh, Minster and um, I've got a little list here. If you're... Yeah, yeah um, it, it was it was a wonderful cast mm. and it, it really was and I, you know, trust me, I mean this, I, I actually dislike watching my own work. I, I seriously dislike it. Mm. But um, but I love seeing, you know, when I occasionally I, uh, I don't I don't sit down and watch episodes of Hello Hello, but occasionally when I catch an episode on television, I and I find myself watching and I think, oh, this is lovely, and and um, because I love watching my friends work, mm. and they're all so good, uh, you know, the cast it was beautifully cast, you know, David was very very clever in that in that respect. And of course, once we'd got through, you know, the first couple of episodes, um, the writers are very clever and they started writing for us. You know, they would, they would, you know, I, I was, I was playing Gruber, but Gruber had become me effectively, you know, the way I played it informed the way he was later written. Yeah. Um, and they were very good at that too. You know, so you weren't just um, presented with writing which you had to fit yourself into. They wrote to your strengths, hmm. and um, you know, so the so the parts adapted as the series went on, hmm. and as the actors got older and you know more secure in the roles, and and they would see new things that you brought to the role that they would that they would then be able to highlight. You know that kind of thing. Yeah, um, I think that's so, certainly, uh, sorry, I think that's certainly why, why the series is so successful. Was obviously the the brilliant, the brilliant actors that obviously were involved, and obviously that and the, and the writing. I think is obviously why it's so. Partly yes, good. yes, it's wonderful writing. It is. It's wonderful writing. The, the the two of them together. I mean, they were both geniuses, really, yeah. um, comic geniuses, and. You know, in in a way, we only had to. You know, it was the old, the old adage. You know, we just had to say the lines and not bump into the furniture. I mean, was that easier said than done with some of the with the farce? Was it easy? Was, was well, it as 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 we say, uh, always, comedy is a very serious business. Hmm. Um, 
you know, Richard Gibson or hair, or hair flick always says, comedy is no laughing matter. Um, and, and it isn't, it's a very serious business, hmm. but um, that said, and obviously, you know, you, they cast people who have good timing and, you know, who, who play comedy for a living. Yeah. Um, but that said, it was, it was a joy to play that writing because it was, it was, it was just so beautifully written. Um, you know, there's wonderful set pieces at the bar between me and Rene. It, it, it was, it was just such a pleasure to, to play those scenes. Mm. It was such a pleasure, and the audiences loved them. You know, they did. We had a, played to a live audience, of course. Well, was the um, live audience element something that you got used to, or was it something that you, you know, were happy from the, from the get go? Um, uh, one got used to it. Hello, hello was the first uh, the first show I did. He's thinking quickly. Yes, I think hello, hello was the first show I did with a live uh, with a live audience. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> but I quickly got used to it, and, and and especially me because I I had had so much experience in the theatre before. Uh, before I ever got a low, low, you know, when a low, low came along, I, I'd already been in the business for, I don't know, 12 years or something. And, um, and I'd done a, a lot of theatre. So I was used to playing to a live audience. And obviously it's different because you have cameras and the audience are behind them. And, and, and it's, it's, it's a different technique yeah. because the camera is so close to you and, you know, it's all very much smaller and all that. But um, it's it's a it's a little bit more like film acting. Hmm. But um, that said, timing, you know, timing jokes with a live audience was something I was used to. Yes, because I've done so much theatre in the past. Hmm. Um, do you have any strong recollections of Richard Mariner or um, Hilary Minister? Oh, very much so, <laughs> Richard Mariner. Oh, yes. Um, he, he was. A wonderful, cantankerous old man <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> with a, with an incredible background. He'd sort of he had a, made a really good living playing mostly very small parts, usually Germans, mm -hmm. and um, <laughs> he nearly he nearly always it seems you know one watches I watch a lot of war films and. Um, films that were made, you know, very soon after the war. Hmm. And Richard always turns up in, and he's nearly always the sort of soldier at the gate who our heroes meet and kill. Hmm. You know, he says sort of, you know, who goes there or, you know, uh, whatever. And, and, and he's, in, he's in a sentry box um, or he's chatting with his friend and they come up behind him and kill him, you know. Um, and he always got those parts because, of course, he spoke good German, although he was, in fact, Russian. Oh. Um, but he spoke excellent German. So that's why he always got those roles. And, he, yeah, he's, it, it's surprising how many classic films he was in, albeit usually in quite small roles. But, you know, he worked with some of the greatest actors of our time, you know, mm. um, and, and he seems to have known them all, you know. I said I saw him in the other day, I, I think something with Steve McQueen. And I thought, my God, you worked with Steve McQueen, you know, it's a hero of mine. Hmm. Um, uh, yeah, anyway, that, and he, he was, by the time Hello, Hello came along, of course, it was very, very much later in his career. Hmm. But... Um, Looking back on it, although he was he he was sometimes rather confused, uh, he didn't tend to to know it as well as he might have done perhaps um, when we came to recording that sort of thing. But all that all that said, and and it was sometimes quite exasperating for the people working with him. But all that said look at him now look at the series now and and mm -hmm. look at his performance and it's wonderful it's yeah. wonderful it's very nicely judged mm. and 
even though you know, I occasionally I'll, I'll I'll watch a scene and I'll think, you know, how dare you look so good? Because I remember we had to shoot that three times because you didn't know the bloody lines, you know. <laughs> Um, but in the end, he was always wonderful. Mm. So, and he was a lovely man. He was he was um, passionate about racing, horse racing. Oh, yeah. And it, it, it almost seemed at rehearsals, for instance, it almost seemed that he wasn't remotely interested in the show. He was he would sit to one side in the rehearsal room, reading the Sporting Life, and and deciding what bets he was going to put on, you know, later in the day. Um, while the rest of us were all, you know, <laughs> concentrating on our work. He, he did have a very nice, uh, well, again, a very small part in uh, You Only Twice, the, the Bond film as a Russian general, very small little, little part. So as you were right, he appears in so many. Yes, yes, you know, he really did. Um, how about Hillary then? I was um, thinking often. Um, he, 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 nice chap, nice chap. He had a radio show. Um, I remember he lived somewhere in the Midlands, and I think he had a radio show in his local town. Mm. Um, and yeah, he he was very good, mm. good fun to work with. Yeah. Because Jack, Jack Haig obviously sadly didn't complete the series because obviously um, he, he passed away. Yes. Um, was that, did, what was he, was his health deteriorating or was it a sudden thing? It was quite sudden. Um, they, uh, at one point, we, we toured Australia uh, twice. Yeah. And... Um, then there was a separate tour to New Zealand. I didn't go. I had a, I was doing a show in the West End and I wasn't available. And so I didn't go on the New Zealand jaunt. Hmm. But when they came back, Jack had been taken ill while there um, or had, you know, pains while there. And he'd come back and seen his doctor and his doctor had said, you know, you, we need to send you for tests and all that. And, and, and that was it, really. <coughs> Excuse me, he died very soon after. It was stomach cancer. Oh, that's a shame. And, and um, so, yes, it, it was quite sudden. Um, you know, one moment one heard he was, he was ill and the next moment one was at his funeral, really. I did go and see him a couple of times in hospital, but... Um, so, you know, it, it, it went on for a few weeks, but not very long. Hmm. Yeah, I, I always miss him when I watch later, later series. And as much as I like the, his replacement, it's... Um... They were replacements, yeah. It, it, somehow with a show like that, which is so... Uh, I don't know, the people, um, the characters are in your living room, you know, every week, week after week. For years and you get to know them yeah and suddenly to substitute somebody else in a role it very rarely works mm. um you know they were quite clever you know it wasn't um you know it wasn't monsieur leclerc now it was monsieur leclerc's brother you know um and and, and so you know there was a reason for it but Somehow, yes, one, one always missed the original actor. I always thought it was such a shame that Richard Gibson didn't do the last series and you had somebody else come in and do Fair Flick. And, yes, um, yes, that was a great shame. Mm. I assume it's probably maybe um, availability or something like that. I, I yes, guess. yes, just availability. He was busy. And um, he he's... One of my one of my best friends, and 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 still to this day, I tell him, you know, oh, you should have, you know, you should have been there. We missed you. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, I imagine and, he might regret perhaps looking back at it, but I suppose you've got to make the. Well, oh, you'll have to talk to him about that. Um, hmm. I do know that Sam Kelly. I can I can say this because Sam is no longer with us, um, and so he's not there to argue with me or, or, or to um, be angry with me for speaking about him. Um, 
I know that in later years he regretted leaving. Ah, yeah. Um, and he was wonderful, and and it, we the series desperately missed him. Oh yeah, yeah. He was he was marvelous as Hans, marvelous. He did return, didn't he, at the very end, briefly? I think he went over to. Mm -hmm or defected or something like that. yes yes there was they, they managed to persuade him to do a sort of bit part at the end but it, 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 yeah he he left after i don't know sort of the fourth series or something and then so we did kind of you know five or six series without him and it was an awful shame oh yeah yeah definitely um you but, did, uh, sorry, sorry. no i was just gonna he he really just he'd had enough he wanted to do other work um and it wasn't, you know, oh, I'm not available or, oh, I want more money. It wasn't as simple as that. It was just, no, actually, I've had enough. <laughs> I want to do something else. I've done my bit in a lower low. I want to do something else. And as I say, he later regretted that decision. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, and, I mean, it, it's part of, of the appeal of being an actor that you will do a huge number of, 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 of roles. And, and That's right. And and it's always a choice, you know, if you're, if you're very lucky, you, you have a choice. Um, uh, you know, where where somebody says to you, please, please, you know, do another series and you get, oh, I'm not sure I want to, you know, lovely, lucky, lucky him to be in that position. But, you know, then, as I say, you have to, uh, you have to make a choice and sometimes you make the right choice and sometimes you don't. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I think um, you know, for, for people like myself who like the continuity of the same job and to, not the same, same job, but to know where you are, we can, yes. Where the money's coming from, so I think you've got to be quite brave to to be an actor and sort of throw yourself into that abyss and not knowing quite where you're going to land, really. Well, yes, I, you know, that's something to do, I suppose, with one's makeup, you know, one's psyche, that one is prepared to to live that way. Um, it's crazy. I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend it to anybody. <laughs> What made you want to get into the profession in the first place? Um, I think probably because I, I have always been a bit mad. Um, it, it, family history relates that I made the announcement when I was 11 years old that that was what I was going to do. Hmm. Um, and my mother was absolutely appalled and was, was certain um, that I would starve in a garret. And indeed was, was still wondering when I was really quite a well-known actor um, and, and, you know, commanding a good salary and had a nice muse house in London and all that. She was still wondering when I'd get a proper job. Um, you know, she never got it, really. She loved the show and would tell people behind my back how wonderful it was. But as I say, she, she always wondered when I'd pull myself together and stop playing and, you know, get a sensible job. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, so, I mean, so it was, yes, it, but, but it was, yeah, I've never wanted to do anything else. And, um, and, and yes, that was, that was always what I was going to do. Hmm. Uh, Cause obviously you, you, what you say you began in, in, in theater work, was that, that correct? Yes. Yes. Um, I did a couple of plays in, college while I was doing a, a, an HND, um, again, at my, at my family's insistence, because, you know, in case I starved mm. when I went to drama school. And um, I did a couple of plays in the sort of the student drama society. And um, I remember one of them, was, which was a comedy, it was a, um, an Elizabethan comedy called The Shoemaker's Holiday. And I remember playing a scene and having the audience absolutely in the palm of my hand. And I thought, this is, this is absolutely what I'm going to be doing with my life. Mm. It was the most wonderful feeling to hear that laughter. And, and it's almost like being a puppet master, you know, uh, controlling that amorphous being on the other side of the footlights yeah. was a wonderful experience. Yeah. And the same thing applies, it's not just comedy, you know, it's not just laughter, the same thing applies with, with drama. 
I mean, you know, being able to make uh, the audience cry, it has the same, uh, has, it gives you the same feeling of, of power and excitement. Mm. Um, it's, it's an enormous joy and an enormous privilege. And I think that, that that's what I've always sort of thirsted for. Mm. And that's why I do what I do. I mean, do you find that when you do conventions that people have lots of stories to say how, how much they enjoyed your role? And do you find it odd that people come up and they that they feel that they know you or, and, and they're completely complete strange to, to yourself? Does that take it, a while? It, 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 it's interesting you say that because that, that's exactly, exactly right. People feel they know you. And it's not just conventions, but I, I remember when... Uh, when the show was at its height, hmm. um, people, people, as you say, they felt they knew you, hmm. and also they felt a sort of sense of ownership. Right. So, um, you know, they would shout at you from across the street. You know, oi, you, you're him. You know, and 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 terribly embarrassing, really. Yeah. Um, and I remember my girlfriend at the time. Um, used to absolutely hate it that when we would you know we would be in a restaurant you know having dinner together and somebody would appear behind me with a, a pad and a pencil and shove it in front of my nose and say sign here you know um and and she would be mortified you know and and it was it was terribly intrusive in one way in another way, it was a you know a great honor, and 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 I I love it now. I'm no longer with the same girlfriend, and 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 I don't have such a problem with it as she did. But mm. it can be very intrusive, as I say, like when you're at dinner. Yeah, the wonderful story of um, of Paul Newman, and please, I'm not in any way comparing. It's just um, his story. Mm. Um, he one day he stopped signing autographs and he never did again and he was famous for it you know that you you couldn't have Paul Newman's autograph and somebody asked him for it um I don't know on the Ed Sullivan show or something television and so he told the story and he said I was standing in a urinal and somebody passed uh, uh shoved a piece of paper under my nose with a pencil and said, would you sign this? And he said, I had my dick in my hand and the guy wanted me to sign. And, and, and he said, and from that moment, never again, hmm. never again. And, and, and a part of me understood that, you know, I, he was a much bigger, you know, he was a proper movie star, but, um, you know, that kind of intrusive. And sometimes people just don't know how to behave. For the most part, they're wonderful. And, and one is moved and touched and, and, as I say, very, very honored and humbled when people want to, want to talk to you about your work and mm. want to, want, they want to tell you that you've given them pleasure. And that's a wonderful thing to have. You know, it's a wonderful thing to have. Lucky me. But just occasionally, as I say, they can be crass and annoying and and you have to take the rough with the smooth you have to you have to accept that some people just are going to be a little bit you know a little bit crass about it and and yeah. and they have a sense of ownership you know you're i put you where you are so you know you have to sign this and you have to you know spend the next half hour talking to me because i pay your salary you know <laughs> yeah. yeah um uh, I have um, I haven't I haven't met you at a, a convention yet, but I have uh, met Richard and and Kim Hartman, and, and they also right. in their in their characters, and I believe you you do as well. Where did that wonderful tradition come about? Two of my closest friends, a um, hundred years ago, I had a phone call uh, from a friend who said um, I've been speaking to this man in Holland who wants to get in touch with you to get you to come to one of these conventions to sign autographs. Mm. And I said, 
we're going back a lot of years, right? Yeah. I said, and this is sort of early 90s or something, I said, I, I, I don't, I don't do that. You know, I don't, I, but I'm an actor. You know, I, I, I was terribly sort of snotty about it, really. Mm. I just said, no, it's not really for me. You know, I don't want to, to come and sign autographs. And this was nothing to do, you know, they, nobody wanted me to dress up in the uniform or anything. They just wanted me to come and sign autographs. And I said, well, you know, it's not, it's not for me. It's not for me. Mm. Anyway, just so, oh, I had a phone call a couple of days later from John Reese Davis. Do you know? Do you know who I'm? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, very well known actor <laughs> and a dear friend of mine. <laughs> he said, "Guy, guy," he said, "I'm here. To, I'm here at a convention in Birmingham." <laughs> he said, "Guy," he said, "We're carrying the money away in suitcases." What's the matter with you? <laughs> really? Okay, you know. Um, well, things were different in those days. Um, and they really did, some of them really did make a lot of money. Mm. And, um, and uh, you know, there were very few conventions, but those that there were, were very successful. Yeah. For the actors. Now there are thousands of conventions and sometimes you come away having earned very little and you know you just have to accept it as a, a fun experience but you don't come away with much money but um anyway i i you know dissolve i rang rang the man or said you know he can ring me and he did and went and did this convention in holland and there were uh, i think four of us from the cast and then a few months later we went and did another one and there was uh, uh, most of the cast and we dressed up in uniform and did a little show and um it was huge fun and yeah we did very well and we signed a lot of autographs got completely exhausted but after that people sort of got the notion that we were available and would would do it mm. and we started to be asked more often yeah. and then you know a few started in England and we were invited to them and you know big things at the NEC that kind of thing and um and it became a sort of tradition and and um we really enjoyed it you know and now I work if if I can if I have the choice I I prefer only to work with Kim and Richard um, and the three of us are a sort of terrible trio and we behave very badly and we give the audience you know a, a lot of and because we get on terribly well together and you know and we get to have dinners together and be outrageous and it's great I love it and I love traveling around the country you know and going to different places I've never been and staying in hotels and you know it's it's cool and then you know people want to meet you and to talk to you and to talk to you about your work and to say how much pleasure it's given them or to, to criticize you or whatever but you know they want to meet you and they want to talk to you and they want to be a yeah. part of it all and I look upon it as basically as giving back you know yeah. Yeah. The, the audience has appreciated what I do for all these years, and um, it's 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 a pleasure to be able to give them something back if they want to meet me and have an autograph signed. You know, lucky me. So, uh, do, you, uh, do you find that the Doctor Who fans, uh, Hello Hello fans, are they do they cross over or are they, are they quite distinctive groups? Um, some of them cross over yeah i get i get um you know i do get people who will come and like they'll have dvds of both shows that they want me to sign or they'll have you know memorabilia of some kind um from you know and and also people who who know my american movies and and that kind of thing you know they want um they want me to sign a poster of, of me with Johnny Depp or they, you know, the, the Seinfeld, you know, they want, they want me and Jerry Seinfeld or whatever. And I'm, I sign a lot of pictures that have nothing whatever to do with hello, hello. And, and, and um, 
or, or Doctor Who, but <clears throat> those are um, obviously the two most, um, I don't know, sort of iconic shows that I was involved in, and particularly because they were, um, with, with a lower low, of course, there was a lot of it. You know, it was 10 years of television. Yeah. It was nearly 100 episodes of television. Yeah. Um, and Genesis of the Daleks, you know, that was a six-part series and, and, you know, not just a one-off television show. Yeah. So, um, of course, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're uh, um, what, I, what I end up signing most of. But as I say, I, I sign a lot of pictures from Pirates of the Caribbean. And I say I'll sign a lot of pictures from uh, Seinfeld and Star Wars and Star Trek and, you know, a lot of these shows that I did in America that, um, that people somehow know about. It's extraordinary that, you know, English people, because I've never done a convention in the States. These are all English people or, or all people who are, you know, European, because um, the same applies in, in Belgium or Holland or France or wherever. Um, but, you know, there will be people who are, I don't know, passionate Star Trek fans. Who, who come to see me and they don't care anything about Doctor Who, you know, <laughs> they only care about Star Trek because they're Trekkers, you know. Um, and, and, and that in itself is great fun because you get to talk about something completely different, you know, oh, what was it like working with them? Where did you shoot? You know, all this. And it's cool. It's cool. Yeah, I must love to have that, that variation on just day in, day out. This yes, well, the same old thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, Indeed, I think it must be it must be rather tiresome if you've only ever you know, if you're famous for one thing, yeah. Um, you know, and and to sort of live off that for the rest of your career is is can't be much fun. No, no, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have thought it would be. Um, I just wanted to ask you about the location filming for Hello Hello because obviously it was it was quite extensive. Um, yes, those and obviously your. I love your your little tank and all the jokes about about that. And uh, what was it like to do to, to work with, say, the tank and out out and about? Oh, uh... uh, it was it was wonderful. It was wonderful. I just loved it. Loved it. We 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 shot in uh, for the most part in Norfolk. Hmm. We're based in Swaffham. Um, David always said that you know. Uh, oh well, it's it's because. Norfolk is very flat and it looks like northern France, you know, so this it could well be Nouveau. Absolute bollocks. It's because he lived there. So, you know, we we would all have to travel, you know, two hours up to up to north of Norfolk and book into a hotel. And David would drive 10 minutes down the road. Um, <laughs> that was where his house was. But um, they, they shot Dad's army there too. Hmm. But it was, it was a glorious time and it was a wonderful place to, to work, um, you know, in the countryside around, around Norfolk, where we, where we did all the shooting. And it was always huge fun driving around in the little tank, you know, and, um, with Clarence, who's a, a dear friend of mine still to this day. And who, who owns the tank. Then it was his, his father who owned it. And um, yeah, his father owned the museum in, in which it came from, and he he brought it and dr drove it. Mm. Um, so he played Clarence. Mm. Um, but now, you know, his father's died, and so he owns the museum, and the tank is still there, and I go and visit it sometimes. Oh, lovely. <laughs> yeah. So I, I assume it, it was it worked very well. It wasn't those one of the situations where it kept breaking down, and it was it was all quite seamless from that. Technical point of view. Uh, I ne it never broke down. Hmm. Um, it never broke down, as far as I remember. I don't remember it ever breaking down. Hmm. Um, the last cast member I wanted to ask you about for Lola was was um, Kenneth Kenneth Connor. I don't know if uh, you you have memories of him. I do. A dear and wonderful man. And when whenever uh, I am asked. Um, the, the, the question which comes up in nearly every interview, mm. what, what was your favorite scene? Um, and mm, I, I nearly always answer, although there were so many, uh, you know, so many scenes that I just loved and, and, and 
um, but I, I, I do have a special place in my heart for the, um, the interrogation of Monsieur Alphonse, you know, when he, um, when there were little mounds of earth appearing in the graveyard and he was brought in for interrogation about why, um, and I got to utter the immortal V asks the questions, you know. Um, it, it was a, it was a marvelous scene. And again, beautiful piece of writing. Mm. And, um, and there was a, a, a part of me, my, what I call my third eye, you know, every actor has, has this, you know, you, 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 however deeply you're in the character, um, there is a part of you that, that must, by definition, be outside uh, the character because you're hitting your marks and you're watching the, you know, cuts from camera to camera, that kind of thing. Um, you know, there's a technical aspect to working in film and television. Um, and, and so it's no good, you know, being in the past and, and uh, you know, to the exclusion of all else. And my, my, I remember my third eye thinking, and I, I, just, I just experienced this outside myself almost as we, as we were shooting this scene. And the audience were falling about and Kenneth was standing there in front of me being wonderful. And I remember thinking, I am, I am standing on stage, TC1 at BBC Television Centre, in front of a live audience of whatever they were, 400 people who are absolutely breaking up. And I'm playing a, a comedy scene with a legend, a man I grew up watching in the carry on films as a small boy i watched him you know carry on sergeant was like in you know made in the 50s you know and i was a child and uh, and here he was opposite me and we were playing this scene together and it was just a wonderful moment and uh, i think you know as as as, as an actor one is lucky to have moments like that. And they're, they're things that you can treasure and take with you to, into your merciful retirement uh, when you're too old to do it anymore. Um, just lovely memories. And, and Kenneth is certainly one. Oh, yeah, it, it was a, one of my favourite actors from, from, you know, the Carry On films. And yes. the episodes you're talking about quite, quite vividly, I think it was on TV fairly recently. And, and yeah. Was it? Right. Yeah. But, um, <clears throat> yes, wonderful, and with and with and with with Hillary, you know, um, shouting at me to 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 interrogate him properly and to stop, you know, <laughs> to stop saying good morning to him politely than asking his name. We know his name, you know. <laughs> and and poor Gruber was so discomforted by the idea of having to having to interrogate somebody, especially somebody he rather liked. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, it was a, it was a very very sympathetic, <coughs> but wasn't he good group? I mean, he was sort of basically a, a, um, well. I think a lot of the the, uh, the the German soldiers were cast as people who didn't found themselves in this world. They didn't want to be soldiers. They didn't want to necessarily. Absolutely, I you know, Gruber was an artist. He 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 would much prefer to have been left alone at home. To, to mm. you know. Do his thing. He was perfectly appalled at the idea of having to shoot peasants, but um, you know he'd been ordered to do so. But again, it's probably uh, that three-dimensional quality and that realism that, again, perhaps is why the series is so um, so highly regarded. Yes, thank you. I think it's part of it, and everybody, um, everybody was was almost equally had the right to be offended because, because we sent everybody up, you know? Yeah. And I think that was, you know, it wasn't just anti-German, you know, it wasn't just um, anti-Nazi. It wasn't, you know, um, it wasn't just bashing the French. We bashed everybody, including the British, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and, and I think that's another part of its charm is that you know everybody was made fun of yeah because it is very popular in, in, in france and germany isn't it it is it is um indeed indeed 
all over the world. It's extraordinary how many countries it's played in over the years. Uh, there was talk of, of doing a movie version like they did with Dad's Army or... There, there was, there was, and thank goodness we, we dissuaded uh, David from doing it. There was talk at one point. Hmm. And um, so I thought the Dad's Army movie was pretty uh, weak. Yeah. Hmm. And, um, and, you know, basically it was just an extended episode of television. And I thought that, you know, it, it, it cheapens the currency somehow. Yeah. Um, and yet the stage show mm. was a triumph. It was an absolute triumph. Mm. And, um, you know, we broke every box office record in, in every theatre we went to in the country on the tour. And then we came into London and we played the Prince of Wales and then we played the Palladium and it was, you know, standing room only. And it was historic, historic. Um, and, and it was a marvelous piece of writing again, mm. but it was specifically for the theater. Mm. And, you know, it wasn't an episode of television at all. It was a completely self-contained um, theatrical piece. Yeah. And, it was a joy and it gave so much pleasure to the audience. Mm. Um, you know, on the opening night at, at the Palladium, we, I honestly thought the roof was going to cave in. I've never heard such laughter. Mm. I think you're right about a, a movie version because when they did movie versions of things like Dad's Army, they tended to be two or three episodes kind of sort of glued together. They were episodes that had been shown just kind of rework. Like yes, doing. yes. And I didn't want us to, to do that. No. And, and, you know, and I think I said to David, you know, please, please don't, don't uh, do that to us because, you know, this is something really special and it needs to be left alone. Oh, yeah, yeah, I completely agree. <clears throat> and then they came up, as I say, they came up with the idea of a stage show and that was just marvellous. You did briefly um, make a appearance in two thousand and seven. They did a sort of the, they did a, um, a low, a low night, and you. What was it yes. like to bring the character to to a close and see what he did next? Um, it, it it wasn't. Um, I sort of regretted doing it. Um, <laughs> Others had said no, and I and I think I should have. Right. Um, it it was quite late in uh, Gordon's working life. Yeah. And he he found the lines impossible, really. Right. Um, so it it took a long time to shoot because of that, and it was. It, you know, and the audience got very tired and it, you know, the shoot went on for a very long time, very late into the night. And um, it, so it wasn't a huge uh, success as far as I was concerned. As I say, I, I sort of thought in, in retrospect, it would have been better to have left it alone, you know. Yeah. Um, but it, it's hard sometimes, you know, when somebody comes along to you in later years and says, you know, how about revisiting this? character and here's some money and you know it, Jeremy was writing it and you know all that mm. and I thought um, oh you know okay super why not you know but as I say I, I think it was probably a mistake and I think from, from a fan point of view it was lovely to see everybody together again and yes of course and there's and there's always that and you you know I, I took that into account um, you know, uh, of course, as well as everything else. And I'm sure I thought not only, you know, it's going to be super fun, but there are going to be people who are, who love this and, and, you know, we owe it to the audience because yeah, um, they love the show and, you know, let's give them a bit more sort of thing. I mean, people still say, when are you going to, you know, come back, you know, and, um, have you ever thought of doing a, you know, retrospective again and we're all like what you know we're all 106 no i know <laughs> it would be ridiculous on the other hand 
as I say, when Richard and Kim and I are together again, mm. um, the years seem to sort of fall away. It's almost like we, you know, we we were still we're still in the show and we're still all in our thirties, you know. Yeah. In the much better to have the have the show, you can go back and and, and, and see your, your your friends and because yeah, people outside of acting can't obviously do, do that really. So it's much nice to have those memories and exactly. That. That, that visual um, memory of it all. Um, yes, and Kim is still gorgeous. <laughs> yeah, I remember seeing her, you know, dressed in a uniform from the show yep. about ten years ago, and I thought, God, she hasn't changed at all. And, no. and, the same Just, and she's still wearing the same uniform. Is it the same same one? Is it? Right. Yes. And look at me. I'm, you know, I'm. I mean, I I, I now should be wearing Richard Marner's uniform. <laughs> you got to keep your your uniforms from the. You know, um, I didn't know. Um, um, Kim did, I, I believe, but I didn't. Hmm. Um, you know, if, if one happened to be good friends with somebody in wardrobe, perhaps one might have. But no, I didn't. Hmm. And for some years, I had to rent my uniform back from Angels, who who rented it originally to the BBC. Um, this uniform that was made for me had my name in it and everything, but Angels owned it, of course. And, you know, I would do like a convention in Holland. Hmm. And so I would have to rent it for the weekend. And with insurance, it cost 250 pounds. And wow. that was that was then hmm. for a weekend. Yeah. So some years ago, a friend of mine uh, who I was working on a movie with, he, he's a costumier, and he said, um, you know, I told him this, uh, we, I can't remember why the subject came up, but he said, um, you need a uniform, I'll make you one. Hmm. And I said, oh, yes, please. <laughs> and he, lo and behold, I, I have my own uniform. Hmm. Um, and so, yes, that's very nice. So when I go to a convention, I don't have to pay anybody 250 pounds for the privilege of dressing up in my own costume. <laughs> <laughs> right, yes. <laughs> um, and there was one person for Doctor Who we didn't touch on. Um, did you meet the producer, Philip Hinchcliffe? Yes, of course I did. Um, and liked him very much. And he, uh, funnily enough, I was asked to do something with him about a year ago and I turned it down. It was uh, like a, one of those not a convention, but a, I think they were showing the episode and there were various actors from the series, Tom and, and people, and, and Philip was, was uh, on the platform, as it were. Mm. And then we would all be, you know, do have a sort of question and answer session afterwards. Yeah. And, um, and Philip asked me to do it. And I, 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 can't remember why I turned it down, but I think I was filming or something. Um, I mean, I didn't do it because I didn't want to do it. I did it. I didn't do it because I couldn't. Um, so it was a shame. But it would have been nice to see him again after all these years. But yes, he's um, he's still around. Oh yes, hopefully you'll bump into him in a convention or something. And you never know. Yes. Um, I did want to ask you about the your American productions. Was it? Um, a different experience to, to doing some sort of like Star Trek Enterprise, Diagnosis, diagnosis Murder, was it <clears throat> you know, bigger crews and, and things compared to, 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 to the UK? Well, um, it, it, that, that particular story I told you was referring to a comedy series, you mm. know, in particular, yeah. um, where, you know, they'll have a, a large team of writers to come up with all these jokes. Um, whereas in England, you know, the two writers, you know, uh, write the whole thing. Um, but um, with something like Diagnosis Murder, it's just, you know, it, it's a bit like shooting a, a drama here or a police show here. Um, the joy there, of course, was was working with Dick Van Dyke, which, is, which was, again, you know, a little bit like working with Kenneth Connor. I mean, you know, somebody who I'd I what I used to watch the Dick Van Dyke show when I was a teenager. I think um, wonderful physical comedian and a marvelous farceur. 
maybe a little bit of of his genius rubbed off on me and that's why I became a fusser in later life I don't know but um it was wonderful to to work with him even though he was he was quite getting on yeah by by then and and uh I mean I think he's still going but he's he you know he he, he had to be treated very carefully and and you know the 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 uh, work day was very short right for him for him you know and all that but you know he was then he was well into his 70s i suppose um and and i i guess he 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 tired easily but it was it was marvelous you know uh, finding myself suddenly i can't remember how it happened why you know that i was cast but mm. i remember walking onto set and, and thinking my god yeah, yeah, Dick Van Dyke. My God, <laughs> it was there was something about uh, being in Hollywood that 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 was was magical. Um, it it really was, you know, finding oneself working with with people one had never dreamed one would one would meet, um, and sometimes even you know just in sort of. Uh, fairly informal situations you know I was I was um, a friend of mine I was doing a movie with a friend of mine and he was the producers were hatching up another project mm. <clears throat> and um, they wanted me to play opposite Robin Williams in a in a uh, drama mm. believe it or not a drama um about well, it was set in Hawaii and it was about the um, the plague island the the island in Hawaii that was set aside for plague victims yeah. and, um, and and Robin and I met the producer and you know had drinks together and things and again I remember thinking my god I'm in a room here with you know with Robin Williams and and, and this producer and we're talking about making a movie together it never happened. The movie never happened. But um, little things like that. There's wonderful memories, you know. That, that lucky me that I just happened to be there, and I happened to be doing a, a, a movie for that producer at the time when he he thought, "Oh, you'd be you'd be right for this other role." And let's let's see what Robin thinks of you. And you know, um, yeah, we got on very well. He's a funny man. Yeah, I always loved loved his work and, and some of his, his, his dramatic roles as well. Because yes, yes, and this was strict, strictly dramatic, a very serious movie. Mm. Um, yes, and and a very good dramatic actor, mm. as well as a, a, a obviously a wonderful comic actor and a wonderful comedian. I mean, some of his uh, stand up comedy is just genius. Mm. He, he his brain worked at a, an extraordinary speed um I, I he must have had a a, a a very high iq i suppose you know because his thought processes were so fast and accelerated and his energy levels um he left me far behind <laughs> just a just a lowly actor and a bear of very little brain I, I mean, I, I love what you said about Dick, Dick Van Dyke because obviously it was a, he was obviously in, in his seventies, probably towards his end of the seventies. I would have thought. I, I would have thought so. Yes, possibly even eighty. I don't know. Um, I think he's still alive, isn't he? Oh, he, yeah, very much so. I mean, he. Um, uh, he must be, it must be close to a hundred. Well, I, I think he's ninety-five or ninety-six. But I think there he, you are. Yeah. He, I think it was his ninetieth or his ninety-first birthday. He. he um, could have, he released a video of him dancing to one of his famous, uh, um, you know, songs, one of his musicals that he did. And he was dancing around the kitchen and, and really going higher than his head. And it was, you know, the trendy worlds couldn't move but the way he was. So he seems to be one of those very fortunate people to um, have kept his physical ability as well as his. Uh, his yes, ability. yes, lucky man. Um, and, it, and I, I used to grow up when I was a kid, Diagnosis Murder was on. Um, BBC One, I think, at lunchtime. So I would I would watch that, and when I was home, and it was a very good, 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 good series. Um, I mean, yes, you, it was fun. When you found something like like Pirates of the Caribbean, what, what was it? 
well, when you when you did Pirates of the Caribbean, obviously a huge Hollywood film, was was this quite a sort of a oh this is a, this is different to what I normally do? What was that kind of like? Well, um, yeah, I, I suppose it's the biggest movie I've ever been involved in, not 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 part wise, but but mm -hmm. uh, just in terms of the the size of the project. Yeah. Um, and I suppose Johnny is, I suppose the biggest movie star, bona fide movie star I, I ever worked with. Um, plus, you know, they flew me to the Caribbean and, and you know, we shot in St. Vincent. Uh, um, and uh, yeah, so they, uh, and they paid me a lot of money. So it was, it was, um, it was, a wonderful experience again you know lucky me um for such a small role uh, and they kept me there for 18 days and um they wouldn't pay my fee my my agent they said well, you know um my agent said you know you know his his fee is such and such for a film and they said oh we're not paying we're not paying his fee we'll pay we'll put him on a day rate so um so they put me on a day rate for this part and booked me for three days for you know a day for costume uh, costume fittings makeup tests and a day for shooting and a day for travel something like that mm. and um so i was going to get you know a quarter of my fee but that was fine but um my agent said that you know they won't pay your fee they're going to pay you a day it so it's fine um but then of course <laughs> And they kept me on the set for 18 days. So they had to pay me about three times my fee. <laughs> because they just kept delaying, you know, and I kept not shooting. And um, I was just in a swimming pool, for, you know, 12 hours a day and, mm. and then eating very well and sleeping and um, not being called to the set. <laughs> um, and yes, as I say, eventually they, they kept me on set for 18 days and had to pay me accordingly. Yes, so they, that's, that's they, a nice problem to have, yeah. Absolutely. Um, my, my penultimate question was not about anything as glamorous as, as the Caribbean, but I want to know about the British Empire episode that you, you did. And what about it? Uh, just, just again, what was like to work on on that show? Really, again, you got some very good. Oh, it was it was good fun. It was it was a uh, it, it was um, uh, towards the end of Hello Hello, and David uh, uh, had was no was no longer directing. Hmm. Um, he'd sort of stepped aside and passed it on to another director. He was still producing it, but um, a director called Mike Stevens was directing the series. And I think this was about series eight or something, I suppose. And um, seven, maybe. And um, he wanted me to, to, to do British Empire, which he was also directing, um, I don't know, the next year or something. So that's how it came about. He just said, will you, you, know, will you play this role? And I said, oh, you know, why not? Um, and again, it's one of those things a little bit like Doctor Who. I remember very little about it, hmm. um, except, funnily enough, I did a, an interview uh, only a couple of weeks ago with Australia. Hmm. And um, they, it was wonderfully researched. And they played clips from some of the most unlikely work um, from my past. And one of the things they played was, was one of the scenes from British Empire. Right. And it was very funny. Um, I, I didn't remember it being so funny, but it was. Um, so yeah, but I remember, as I say, I remember very little about it. Again, that's a classic show that is perhaps still a bit un underrated. You know, it's not, it's got much attention to the low black adder, but no, um, no, be good in, in, in many ways. Yeah. Um, the, the last thing I wanted to ask you, Guy, was um, I wanted to know what was your um your favorite project or, or the role that you were most proud of to play in your career perhaps excluding the low low and, and, and doctor who but um well if you exclude a low low hmm. um <clears throat> i i i suppose 
quite honestly, I would go all the way back to the very beginning of my career. In fact, before my career really started, my graduating performance at drama school, mm. I, I played at the Weber Douglas Academy. I played the MC in Cabaret. And it was a joy to play, a, an absolute joy. And I had met uh, the actor who played it in the West End. It was an actor called Barry Denon, an American actor. Uh, not Joel Gray, who played it on Broadway and in the movie. <clears throat> but um, he, he, he played it in the West End and he happened to be in the West End mm. at the time when I was going to play the MC. Yeah. And he was doing a, a, a Shakespeare um, at the Roundhouse. And I wrote to him and he said, come and meet me in, you know, in the theatre and we'll chat. And um, it's it a very interesting experience. And I mean, he couldn't, you know, help me really. And I didn't want any help. I just, I just was interested to meet the man who had played this. And I suppose I asked him some questions about it. But anyway, then I, you know, we went into rehearsals and I played it and I won all kinds of awards. And it was, it was just the most rewarding part hmm. um, is a very, it's a marvelous show. Yeah. And, and it sort of la launched my career as well because, because I won awards. And so I was quite, you know, people quite wanted me uh, for work. And so my, my first year or two in the, in the profession was kind of set hmm. from that moment. You know what I mean? I mean, I got, I mean, you know, I got an agent, I got, a, I got my first job in rep um, and I went away to rep for a year and then I went straight into the West End. And so I was sort of kind of booked ahead, as it were, which was really nice and really unusual. Yeah. So, yes, that would probably be my answer. Oh, that's, that's, that's wonderful. Um, and um, just a second part to that, was there ever a character that or part that you wanted to play but you didn't get? Was there a role that or type of person that you would like to play in, in the future? <clears throat> um, oh, there are, so, there are so many parts that, you know, one misses out on, uh, one wishes one had got. Um, about the third takeover, I think it was the third takeover of the lead in Phantom of the Opera. Right. Um, I had five auditions, count them five. And the last one was in front of Hal Prince himself at 11 o'clock at night. Right. <clears throat> because he had flown in from New York mm. and was on a layover before he flew on to somewhere or other else where he was opening another production. And um, he came, came to Her Majesty and auditioned me and uh yeah as i say that was my fifth audition having you know, i'd auditioned for the assistant musical director for the musical director for the director of the show and then finally for, for his nibs mm. and in the end i didn't get it <laughs> but uh so that i regretted that especially yeah. as they were going to pay me a great deal of money oh yes i, I, I can imagine <laughs> And, um, and I loved that score. I loved singing it. And um, couldn't now, of course. I couldn't uh, begin to sing it now. But then I could. <clears throat> and um, yeah, so that I regret not getting. A couple of movies that I missed out on, I really regret not getting. Mm. But um, that, again, it's part of the, of the baggage that mm. you take on when you're when you're an actor you know and it's not just being a a, a regular sort of jobbing actor like me it's you know even stars go through this you know you look at some of the famous roles <coughs> that stars have either turned down or failed to get yeah that's true yeah um and you know it as i say that's part of the profession it's part of the job we do hmm. uh you know, if somebody else is more right on the day or better on the day or uh, whatever, um, tough tip. It's just the way it is. 
Is there any roles or, or type of characters that you hope that you will play uh, in the future? Is there anything in the pipeline you think, oh, this is this is different? Or last question? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yes, yes. Sorry. My, my, I, I need to go. My favorite role. Um, yes. <laughs> such an easy question to answer, Philip. Hmm. My next one. Ah. <laughs> and is that always the case? Because yep. potential. For yep. Yep. I I love to work. Hmm. I love to work. Um, my next thing I think is a is a is a film in October, and um, so I guess that's what I want to do most, unless something comes in between. But um, hmm. uh, yeah. Um, my 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 the, the role I most want to do is the next role. <laughs> well, that's lovely to have that enthusiasm still after a long career. To... Yes, yes. As long as I you know can 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 uh, stand upright in the morning and and put one foot in front of the other, I'll keep working. They'll have to carry me out in a box. Well, I very much look forward to your future projects, and I hope they go very well, Guy. And thank and you for spending so much so much time talking to me. I've enjoyed every. Every second of it. Been Thanks very much. It's been a great pleasure. You're very kind. Thank, thank you very much. Have a, take, have a good week and um, take care. Take care. Bye bye. Bye.